All right. So, um, this, so we're starting another module today, and we'll cover this module this week and next week. Um, but this module, in some ways, doesn't contain anything new. The only thing that's really going to be new is kind of the numerical scheme that we're going to use to solve the problem at hand. And the specifics of the problem at hand are simply, right, so the, the past kind of month, effectively, we have covered um, diffusive processes, right? So we covered diffusive processes in one dimension, the specific system that we kind of were applying, diffusion and numerical solutions to, was uh, the transport of heat from the atmosphere into a, a permafrost-laden soil, and examining right, the behavior of that permafrost-laden soil as a function of the temperature forcings under both kind of steady, a, a steady but varying forcing and one that had a trend to it. We looked at two-dimensional diffusion in the form of uh, a landscape evolution model, right, where sediment was being transported from higher elevation to lower elevations in two dimensions in X and Y in proportion to the, the gradient, right? And we were upload, uplifting the landscape while kind of pinning down the corners of that landscape and allowing the topography to evolve, okay? And then following that, um, what we did is we looked at advect, advective problems, right? Problems that were characterized by the kind of passive transport of something, often kind of a contaminant but not always, um, with kind of a mean fluid flow, right? Um, uh, in, in particular, we looked at the transport of um, a dissolved radioactive contaminant that was being transported in, a, in an aquifer which had kind of a steady Darcy flux through it, right? So there wasn't spatial vari variability in the velocity. It was a constant velocity, and we looked at kind of how long it would take um, for this contaminant to make it from the contamination source to some location of interest, like a, you know, a township or a village where um, they were pumping the water out of the aquifer and presumably using it for domestic purposes. And then last week, we looked at a very sort of special kind of problem that advection can create, and that occurs often when we are um, when it's the actual velocity or the momentum that we are advecting, right? And, and we talked about how um, that can lead to chaotic processes or processes that sensitively depend on the value of the initial condition, right? And we examined a whole range of um, consequences of that. So perhaps unsurprisingly, right, this next module is, is looking at the combination, right? So in, in most systems in the world, where we have kind of a, a fluid, a, a flowing medium, right? Whether that flowing medium happens to be air or water um, or, I don't know, beer um, or lava, right? Um, we, we have, those systems are not characterized by either purely advection or purely diffusive transport, right? It's some combination of the two. Um, and so... This module is about, oh, advection diffusion problems. Um, and frequently, uh, this is a, a minor side note. But um, oftentimes, uh, particularly in groundwater systems, um, when we talk about transport, especially of kind of, um, you know, dissolved, uh, dissolved constituents, whether those are kind of like ions, right, or cations, um, things like weathering products or contaminants, right, um, we don't necessarily uh, call, so groundwater folks will distinguish between diffusion and what they call dispersion. 
right? Um, and just the difference between that they that they will make in groundwater between diffusion and dispersion is subtle, right? Diffusion is kind of a uh, is often referred to in groundwater as a molecular process, right? So, you know, that's the classic. You have a fish tank, right? Of um, I'll draw a picture of this right real quick. So this is the distinction. between um, uh, diffusion and dispersion. In, uh, we'll just say fluid transport. Okay, so Diffusion is thought of as sort of a molecular process, right? So this is diffusion. And it's a molecular process. Right, and so if I have my fish tank here of water, right? And I inject a dye here, right? So, and this kind of creates, you know, plumes. Right, so this is like a plume of dye, and in this system, my velocity is zero, so this water is still, right, if I just let this system run, right, and I don't do anything, I just inject the dye, what eventually happens to this dye? Like if I let this run for all eternity, it equilibrates throughout, right? And so the, the dye will sort of diffuse and the concentration, we no longer will have a concentration gradient. The concentration will simply be the mass of this dye that we injected divided by the mass of the water everywhere, right? It will be kind of a uniform, well-mixed fluid mass, okay? So that's the process of diffusion. That is controlled by, simply by those, those dye particles being close to one another and having some amount of energy, right? And they will bounce off one another. Um, and eventually that will cause them to spread out and occupy kind of the whole space. So that's the process of diffusion. Um, and it contrasts with uh, the process of dispersion. And what I want to do in this case is draw kind of a cross section of an aquifer, right? So this will be dispersion. So here, right, I have some grains, right, that are kind of irregular and they're packed in certain ways as a product of kind of the geologic and sedimentary processes that has given rise to this aquifer or the metamorphic processes that have, you know, caused this aquifer to, to break up. Right, so I'm going to add a bunch of particles here. And in this case, my velocity is non-zero. So my velocity is greater than zero and from left to right. Okay, and now let's say, right, so I have, you know, this is a saturated media in here. Right, so there's water everywhere. So this aquifer is saturated. 
And now I have a contaminant that is moving in over here, right? So it's, it's coming in this way, and let's say that I have this plume of contaminant that's, that's here, right? That is the origin of my contaminant plume. So this is the origin of contamination. Okay, now what's going to happen, right, is that this contaminant plume, when it encounters these clasts, these sediments within my aquifer, right, what's going to happen is that some are going to go around this way, others are going to go around this way, right, and then this process will, will kind of continue to happen, right, so... Um, you know, these, some of these will then encounter the next rock. They might get kind of stuck here, right? Form a little bit of an eddy and then finally kind of migrate over here. Some will go this way, right? Some will have a very clean line all the way through. Some will take kind of a tortured path right through. Some will get stuck here for a while and then kind of make their way through, right? So we wind up having these kind of tortuous paths through our, our aquifer. That's a product of kind of the interactions of individual kind of contaminant particles with these individual grains, right? And the net effect of this is that when I go downstream, the concentrations will reduce because this initially concentrated stream of particles has now been forced through a sequence of just mechanical properties or mechanical processes into kind of this wider plume, right? And so this is, dispersion is a mechanical process, right? So it happens, it happens to things that, that you know, um, right, it happens to any, anything and you don't have to invoke anything about the chemistry, right? You don't need to know anything about what this contaminant is and its kind of affinity for each other or its charge or how much energy, what its temperature is, right? This occurs purely due to, um, due to mechanical process, right? Just interactions of individual particles with the grains of the aquifer. Now, the mathematics of these is exactly the same. Right, so the diffusive transport will look something like this, right? So it'll be something like um, D times the second derivative of the concentration of X. Okay, and uh, um, We'll call, oops, we'll call this D sub molecular, D sub mole, right? Whereas the dispersive transport looks something like this, right? So this is like D mechanical times D squared C DX squared, okay? Um, and in point of fact, almost always, that mechanical dispersion is much greater than the molecular part, right? Um, so oftentimes, 
what you will see in a lot of transport problems and environmental problems, whether that's in aquifers or whether that's actually in rivers, right, is that we just, you know, so you can have both of these terms going on in this advection, dis dispersion, diffusion problem, but often we just neglect the molecular diffusion part of the problem because the mechanical dispersion part is much, much more important. But at the end of the day, the equation looks exactly the same um, as if it were an advection diffusion problem, right? So that's some background into why some people will call this advection diffusion. diffusion. Some people will call it advection dispersion. Those are mathematically the same thing. It's just something's going on differently kind of at the mechanical scale. So if you're confused by that, if you ever read something, dig a little deeper, or ask the person you're talking to, hey, are, are, you know, is this mechanical dispersion that you're talking about in this, or is this molecular diffusion, or some combination of the two? Because um, they should be able to tell you, okay? Okay, so now let's talk sort of a little bit about what these processes look like, right? So the next thing I want to do is draw a picture of what advection looks like. With, with as a function of time, right? So this will be, let's see how much, I have enough room, I have plenty of room, okay. So this will be at some time t equals zero, kind of initially, this will be at some subsequent time, This will be at some other later time. We'll call it t equals n delta t. And we'll draw the same, you know, we'll draw what happens as well for diffusion. But let's talk about advection first, right? So I'll, I'll color the thing that I'm transporting in red. Right, so initially, let's say, we just have this kind of slug of stuff at the origin, right? This is sort of consistent with just dumping a wheelbarrow full of um, something like a salt or rhodamine dye in a river all at once, right? Um, and just leaving it there, right? So we're not continuing to add to it, we're just gonna dump that wheelbarrow. And then what happens in time, right, is that at some point later in time, if this is a purely advective process, that whole slug of material will just be being transported downstream or down gradient in a way that doesn't affect the shape of that slug, right? That slug moves as kind of a monolithic entity through our river, canal, stream, pipe system, whatever, okay? So that's what advection looks like. By contrast, if we draw the same set of axes, right? So I should label these. This is concentration, concentration, concentration. This is time. So I'm gonna put the same set of, of axes. Now I'm gonna contrast this with, oops. Uh, let's say, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna call this dispersion. So I'm gonna try and get my axes as close to parallel here as I can. Okay, this is still concentration, right? So C, 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 still time, T, 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 okay. And now, 
what happens, right, is if I have that same slug of, you know, some contaminant at the origin, right, what will happen with time is that slowly, right, this concentration will kind of spread out. That's way too high. Let's see. Okay. Right, so I get this this process of kind of smearing smearing out that initial slug, right? I put it there and gradually, just because there's so much concentration gradient, right, transport is really high at the beginning. And then at further time, right, it sort of is even more smeared out. Now, um, I heard some of you chatting about areas under curve at the beginning of class, right? What does the area under this curve equal? If this is concentration and I integrate this, and this is a conservative property, right? This is literally like a rhodamine dye or a salt that never leaves the environment or heat, right? Heat is, you know, extremely well conserved. What does the area under this curve represent? If this is like my salt concentration. It's, so the total area is equal to what? This area. Yeah, so it's the, the integral of, of under this curve, if I knew the mathematical function, right, or if I was numerically integrating by breaking it into small boxes and summing them up. But that total amount, that total area under this curve would just be the mass of the contaminant that was injected, right? So if I integrated this with respect to time, and that's a good check on any of my models, right, if I integrate this over time, I should get that initial mass that I injected into the system, right? And that's an illustration of mass conservation, okay? Okay, so that's how these two processes that we've been dealing with for about the past month, maybe month and a half, contrast with one another, okay? So now what we want to do is we want to think about, so advection dispersion is just a, and this has probably been a while since a lot of you have heard this term. Maybe this is the first time some of you have superposition of advection and dispersion processes. Okay, and so now we're gonna draw what advection dispersion looks like. Okay, so This is C, this is T equals zero, this is T this is T equal to I delta T and this is C, this is T equal to N delta T, okay? All right, so initially again, we just have this slug of stuff, 
right? This is our initial condition. There's nothing anywhere except it in the vicinity of the origin where we have this kind of spike or what we call a delta function of this material kind of emplaced instantaneously at, at the origin of our, our domain, right? Okay, you know what I just realized? I made a mistake. So these are not T's, these are X's. I apologize. Okay, so this is distance. Oops. This is also distance. Okay. okay. So now, right, what we have is at some intermediate time step, I times delta T, what we will have is just basically the combination, right? When we say superposition, it's just a fancy way of saying kind of the, the sum of both of these kind of processes or curves. Right, so we have some amount of motion that is due to advection, right? So the, the center of our curve would be kind of right here, right? But then we have some amount of spreading out of that slug that's due to dispersion or diffusive processes, right? And so we can think about this, right, as, as this kind of being controlling, this is controlled by, advection, right, and then the spread of this, this part here is controlled by diffusion or dispersion. Okay, so then if we went to a subsequent time step, we have even more advection, right? So this plume will have been transported even further to the right. Its peak will have been reduced even more, and we get even more kind of spreading out due to, due to the diffusive processes, right? So we get something maybe it looks like this. All right, so again, let's label and say that if this is the centroid, right, this distance here is controlled by advection. And this spread part here, oops, is controlled by diffusion. Or dispersion. Yeah? Is this really similar to numerical diffusion? Is there, what's the difference between the two? Yes. So the question is, is um, this looks awfully similar to this process we encountered when we did our advection modeling, right? Um, we saw that if we weren't careful with that current condition, we got this process of numerical diffusion or kind of an artificial spreading out of that kind of slug of contaminant, right? Um, 
And the, the question is, is, well, how does that relate to actual diffusion? Um, and the answer is, is that it's, uh, it's, it's got a complicated relationship with diffusion. And so what you encountered in that numerical diffusion aspect of the lab was, in fact, diffusion that was, that was artificially created by having current conditions that weren't close to one, right? So you artificially created diffusion where there should have been none. Now in here, in an advection dispersion problem, what we're saying is that no, there is diffusion, there is dispersion, and it's a physical, an actual physical process, right? But the thing that's complicated here, and as we'll see in the governing equation that we'll get to in a moment, is that we still have, with the advective part of the solution, with the advective, or the solution to the ad advective part of the problem, we still have a potential for having numerical diffusion, right? So the problem and the trick that we're gonna have to get around is how do we solve the equations for the advective, um, advection dispersion equation? How do we solve those in a way that keeps our diffusive solution stable, but also does not introduce numerical diffusion, right? Because we don't want to in inject too much dis dispersion or diffusion due to our numer numeric the numerics of our solution. Does that make sense? So what, what that's going to wind up, um, what's going to wind up happening is we're going to actually wind up having two criteria that we need to kind of keep our eye on when we solve these advection dispersion relationships with a numerical model, right? We have one part that's controlled by the stability of this diffusive process. We have, so we have one, you know, one constant that we have to be careful of there. We'll have another constant that we have to be careful of with respect to the advection part. So, does that help? Yes, it makes more sense with the field. Okay. But um, the, the key takeaway to there, right, is that numerical dispersion is not, numerical diffusion is not real, right? We're trying to bat that down as much as possible while representing the actual dispersion that should be happening, okay? Okay, so, what do the equations that um, control um, advection dispersion look like? I'm in fact just going to skip to the solution because um, I don't want to derive it. Um, but in this case, so like the, let's put it down here, the governing equation to the advection dispersion problem is. Um, and what you'll see here is that this is literally just kind of the, the sum of both the advection and dispersive parts, right? So we have something like dc, dm, this should be a full derivative, sorry, dc dt plus u times the partial of concentration with respect to space minus d times the second derivative of the concentration with respect to space. And this is going to be equal to our sources and sink term, right? So if you have no sources and sinks, right, we're not pumping any water out or injecting any water, contaminated water, this is zero. But what you can clearly see here, right, is that you should recognize this is the advection part And this is the dispersive 
right? So when we look at this equation and we go back up to these curves here, right, we are literally saying that this distance here, right, this part that's controlled by advection is driven by this part of the equation, this term in the equation, and this distance here, right, the spread of our plume, right, that is controlled by this diffusive term in our equation, okay? Okay, so let's take a break there, come back in five at uh, 15 after, and then we'll proceed with going straight to the numerical solution. So this time I'm not going to kind of go through the full derivation of the, um, of the, the solution. It's got a cute name. Actually, it's got a quick name. Its name is quick. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about how it blends um, what we did in the advection solution with what we did in the diffusion solution to get the answer, and then we'll also come back and examine those stability terms because there will be two of them, okay? All right, so perfect timing. So come back at 15 after and we'll start from there. Okay, welcome back. So, um, what I want to do now as we pivot to implementing the numerical scheme is describe the problem that we're going to be working on for the next two weeks, which is kind of one that's near and dear to my heart, um, but is, uh, is this... Um, this problem of infiltration of water into, into soil, right? So, um, so let me do the first thing that I, as an engineer, was taught to do, right, which is to draw a picture. So, uh, again, we're going to be thinking about vertical motions now, again, going back to kind of our heat diffusion problem, right? So what I want to do is here is my soil column, right, and uh, this is going to be, um, so this is, all, this is my soil column, this is also a, a plot of my soil moisture values, theta, draw that better, theta, oh, that was not all, okay, theta, Right, and then this is going to be depth z. Okay, and this is this is my whoops. This is my soil column. And I want to be uh, uh, very clear here and say that this is um, infiltration. of water in unsaturated soils, okay? So what we're going to do, right, is we're going to start off with a completely dry soil, right? So, um, just to, uh, just a reminder of what the definition of soil moisture is here, right? So theta is just defined as the volume of water over the volume of solids plus the volume of voids in our soil, right? So it's the, we often call theta the volumetric soil moisture. It often is reported in, it's dimensionless, but it has units, they're usually something like centimeters cubed of water per centimeters cubed of soil, 
Volume of voids, or vo yeah, volume of, so of air, um, yeah. Uh, void volume is something that I think you, in geotech you discuss a lot. Um, I didn't do well in geotech, FYI. Um, uh, um, but also those of you that are from a geoscience background, like you, you probably in groundwater, um, but also maybe um, some of your earth materials classes might have talked about, you know, void volumes, right? Um, there's one caveat here between kind of if, if you if you're in like a very 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 geo geology focused um, uh, program versus the civil folks right so um, the one thing that I want to make clear here is that the volume of voids in this definition of soil moisture are connected voids right so um, the geologist will think of like you know pore space that winds up in the middle of rocks because of, um, right, like uh, especially um, igneous rocks and extrusive rocks, so things that were formed from like volcanic lava flows, right, because of the volatiles like water that are contained there as you bring it to the surface you get kind of bubbles that form inside of clasts of lava but they're disconnected from other pores. And so if you, if you did the mass measurement, right, you'd, you'd still have a component there that was void volume, um, but it's not exposed to anything, right? It's not hydrologically active. So this part here is just the hydrologically active part. Um, that other voids, those voids that are trapped within the class are like super small, right? There's, it's almost always dominated by the hydrologically active um, volume. Okay, so, but what this is going to look like through time, right, to get the math, to get the visual picture of what we're aiming to see is that initially, right, we're going to have zero moisture here, right, and then our initial condition is just going to be that at the top we have kind of saturated conditions, so we think about this as, um, you know, all of a sudden having a deluge of water at the top and completely saturating the soil at the top, right? So this is T equal to zero, right? And then through time, we're going to get some curve that looks like this. Uh, I don't like that. Um, we'll get some curve that looks like this. Some, bit too diffusive, right? So this would be like some um, t equals one, right? And then we get another curve here that's t equals to two. And then let's say that we have some other curve here. This is t equals three, right? So, so why is this an advective dispersion like problem, well, you could probably graphically see it, right, that, okay, at some subsequent time, you know, there's some kind of velocity with which that, you know, water is propagating into the ground, right, but there's also some kind of smearing of that wetting front that looks like a diffusive problem, and at a later time step, you can see that there's uh, still some net motion into the ground that is um, advective-like, right? Um, we call that uh, part often the uh, piston flow process, right? Because it's like a piston is moving into the soil column. We have even more dispersion. And then when you go out to later time horizons even, Right, we get a point at which maybe we're even increasing the soil moisture at the at the bottom of our soil column. So we see this advective part, and we see this kind of dispersion part. So in in actual unsaturated soils, what's the rationale for thinking of this as an advection dispersion process? Right. So why can infiltration? 
spelling. Be thought of as an advection dispersion problem. Okay, and so what that requires us to do is think about, okay, what is the physical process that's responsible for the advection part? What is the physical process that's responsible for the diff diffusion or dispersion part, okay? So if we think about that, Okay, uh, so why, why is there kind of an advection part to this problem? What is responsible for pulling this wetting front of water down into the soil? What's one of the things? Ideas? Gravity. Yeah, gravity, right? So that's just the gravity dominated part, right? Gravity driven flow. This water up here has a weight, right? And presumably we're talking about the, a soil column on Earth, right? And so the, the weight of that water, the mass of that water is being pulled towards the center of the earth by gravitational forces. So there's a gravitational part of this, okay? So, all right, gravity-driven flow, okay? What's, what's responsible for the diversion, dif diffusion or dispersion part? This part is maybe a little bit more difficult, but let me draw a picture here and say that this is a hint. So if we have just a, a bucket of water here and we have a glass tube, right? So, and this is just atmospheric pressure out here. Okay, what will happen to, where will, what will happen to the water inside this glass tube? Where will, what will it do? It'll rise up, and why? Capillary action. Yeah, capillary action, exactly, right? So we get this meniscus here, and we get this capillary drive into our system, right? So this is... This is the, the capillarity for forces, right? And, right, if, if you remember the, the length of that, right, of, of how high that water goes is a function of a lot of things, right? It's a function of uh, the diameter of the tubes. It's a function of the viscosity of the water. And it's actually a function of gravity, I think. Right. Yeah. The, the, it, right. And this is measured in part by this contact angle, right? This, this contact angle, right? The higher the contact angle, the greater the capillary forces, right? And it, it, so this has to do with surface tension, right? It's the, it's the water adhering to the sides of this glass tube, right? So the dispersion part is driven by capillary forces. And the way that we often think about this, right, is, um, uh, I don't know if they, you should cover this in maybe like advanced hydrology classes. I don't know if Jim covers this in his hydrology class. Um, but we often think about um, soils, right? We conceptualize soils as just a bundle of capillary tubes, right? So our model of soils 
is just a, a bundle of capillaries, capillary tubes, with just different radii, right? So we think of our pores as just this bundle of capillary tubes, right? Some are tiny and some are much larger, right? So the dispersive part is due to capillary forces in the soil. Okay. So, um, or, you know, what we call, um, we, we refer to this in net as kind of the, the tensive or tensile forces in the soil, right? That's the tendency of the soil, right? If you think about the soil as being a bundle of capillary tubes, that if you put that bundle of capillary tubes in water, right, you're going to get um, different, you're going to get the water kind of going up to different heights in those capillary tubes as a function of the diameter of those capillary tubes. And if you plotted, right, if you, if you plotted the heights of all of those capillary tubes, that capillary, that height, right, would, would look something like this. It would look like a diffusion plot with kind of the mean capillary diameter representing kind of the midway point, right, and the really small capillaries having higher there are the big capillaries having a much lower kind of capillary, um, capillary height, okay? So that's why we can think of this as, a, as an advection dif dispersion problem, okay? So what we're going to do is I want to draw the domain that we're going to be simulating. So this is the numerical domain. Okay, and again, we're going to break the soil into evenly sliced, evenly, even thickness slices of soil. And we're going to call this um, point, well, actually, I'm going to label the slices themselves, right? So this is going to be I. This is going to be I minus one. This is going to be I minus two. This is going to be I plus one. Yeah, so if we think about this, like, uh, positive into the soil is, is the equivalent of just, you know, if we, if we think about this curve that we drew before the, um, these curves that we uh, drew before, right, the way that we can think about this as um, is effectively just taking this figure here and rotating it clockwise 90 degrees, right? Okay. All right. So, so in this case, our, our governing equation, if we just substitute, um, if we just substitute theta into the ADE, that's our advection dispersion equation. Okay. We're going to get something that looks like this. D theta dt plus... U, and I'm going to come back to that in a second, times d theta dz minus d d squared theta dz squared. 
and this is going to equal my sources and sinks term. Okay. Okay. So let's real quick before we just set it equal to zero for convenience, talk about what these sources, source and sink terms could correspond to in the real world, right? In, in the actual world. So what could be responsible for sources and sinks? And if you're a plant lover, this should immediately cue something. The yeah, the plant's doing what though? They absorb water into the soil, and then where does it go? Yeah, so what's going on here, right, is that these source, one of these source and sink terms is that there's, what do plants put down into the soil? Roots, right? So those roots diffuse water into them, right? And, and what's driving that is the demand for water by the atmosphere, right? So what's happening is that the plants are opening their stomata, they're exchanging water with the atmosphere in exchange for carbon dioxide, right? That carbon dioxide comes in and they turn it into carbohydrates, right? Um, and that water leaves and that creates a, a, t a tensile force down into the soil in which they're pulling up water out of the soil. So the big term that we think about in terms of a source or sink in the real world is, is transpiration by plants, right? Plants actively pulling water out of the soil, okay? So now we're just going to set that equal to zero, okay? Um, now in the real world, right, we would have to think about that. We'd have to say, okay, where are the plants pulling water from? What's cause, right? What's the rate at which they're doing that? And that, that's where we get into perhaps an advertisement for a course that will be taught in the future, the land-atmosphere interactions, right? So the atmosphere is controlling how much water the plants demand, right? And the plants respond by either taking that water up from the soil, or if it's not available, uh, shutting their stomata, um, undergoing stress, and potentially wilting, right? So, so this is where our connection between the land surface and the atmosphere and the deeper soil and the atmosphere comes in. And for now, we're going to completely neglect that just for the purposes of actually describing how the soil moisture changes with respect to time, okay? So what I want to do is I said I would come back to, right, what is this velocity? Yeah, except in this case, and I'm going to come back to this next Tuesday, because this, this is where it gets very complicated, and we we're making an approximation on how this departs from the, um, from the actual physics of the way that we describe this, right? So this, for now, we're going to think of this as some kind of conductivity term, right? So we're going to call this a conductivity Right? It's consistent with the idea of a conductivity in the, right? So it's not exactly the saturated hydraulic conductivity, but some kind of conduct conductivity. We can call it an effective conductivity, right? And it will have units of length per time, right? And that's consistent with actual conductivity units, right? We describe hydraulic conductivity in like centimeters per day or something like that. Okay, so it's just some conductivity. We might need to actually fit it. It might be a calibration parameter. And then this is just going to be a diffusion, right? And so this is just, um, this is the soil diffusivity. You can think of that soil diffusivity as just being something that characterizes the distribution of these capillary tubes, right? Right? 
So if we have a higher D, that might mean we have more of these smaller capillaries, right? If we have a lower D, it means we have more of these big capillaries, okay? Okay, so if we describe numerically our solution here, this is in your books, so the derivation of it, and there's even they skip steps in the derivation process in your book. But if we skip right to the actual solution, this is solved using the quick scheme. then the answer we get is that theta at location i and time n plus 1 is equal to theta at location i time n minus c times 1 eighth theta at location i minus 2. time n minus 7 eighths times theta at i minus 1 time n plus 3 eighths theta time i, location i time n plus 3 eighths theta location i plus one time n, okay? And then there's another term here. So this is actually the advection part. And then we have the diffusion part, which is alpha times theta location i minus one time n My, uh, minus two theta location i time n plus theta i plus one time n, okay? So this part here should look familiar. This part here, again, looks still kind of weird. It looks weird, but maybe given the discussion we had about numerical integration schemes last Tuesday, right, we talked about runga kutta methods, um, maybe this becomes a little bit more, right, there's a mental model we have there to connect to at least. Okay, so here's the advective part, here's the diffusive part. Let's define what these constants will be. C will equal our effective conductivity times delta T over delta X, right? So this is that same current condition. And the diffusion parameter is equal to D delta T over delta, sorry, this should be a Z. delta z squared, okay, and quick will be accurate and stable when alpha plus c over 4 is less than or equal to one half, and c squared is less than or equal to two alpha, okay? Okay, so as we wrap up right here, this shows that we have to think about those advection and dispersion constants 
not just independently, but in combination with one another, right? So we have terms here for stability and accuracy that require us to think about, right, the sum of A, alpha, and C, and the relationship, the inequality relationship between C squared and alpha, right? So we have to think about them in combination with one another. Okay, so they're not completely independent, okay? And if we look back up here again, right, we see our, our old friends. We have a diffusivity constant here that's a product of the diffusivity and the time step and the spatial step in our current condition here that's a product of our advection velocity and the time step and the spatial step. Okay, all right. So what we'll do on Thursday is we'll actually examine a notebook in which these equations are solved, right? And we're trying to predict the evolution of soil moisture with both depth and time. And then um, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna come back and on next Tuesday, I'm gonna show you the actual equation that we use to model this infiltration process into soils and how we've departed from it, the assumptions that we've made to treat it as an advection dispersion process. Okay? All right, thanks everybody. And I know I'm behind on getting both videos and notes posted. I will do that today, so, or tomorrow. Okay, see y'all Thursday.